Welcome everyone to Google Tools for Behavior and Data Intervention. My name is Jessica Conrad and I'm joined here with my friend and colleague Clive Williams who will introduce himself in a couple minutes. Want to remind you, um, this session will be recorded. We will be sending this recording out. We always like to start off right off the bat with an accessibility promise, and we're committed to following the framework of universal design for learning. So a few things that are used today, as I mentioned before, there are captions both in the recording and live here today. We have simple backgrounds with high contrast real font, digital materials that are going to be provided for your own use, shortened links, QR codes. You're going to be able to see multiple examples of what we're talking about today. And you also have an opportunity for individualized follow-up support. If you have any issues accessing this today, please pop in the chat box, let me know, or reach out to me by email. My email's on the screen. It's jconrad at patentsproject.org. That's J-C-O-N-R-A-D at P-A-T-I-N-S project.org. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Clive Williams. I'm co-presenting this information. My past role um, in the UK, uh, before I came here in 2005, six, was first working as a licensed social worker and also um, a supervisor for social workers who wanted to be trained and fully qualified as social workers. I also did another qualification whilst teaching at a university, which was a, um, a degree, a master's degree in equal, equality of opportunities, it was called. Like diversity, I think, would be a better word to describe for you guys to kind of understand. Um, in the past, in terms of my own personal benefits, I actually had a business for six years in England. I used to train um, parents, carers, and people who wanted to work with children, whether it's in a childcare facility, in a daycare facility, or as an assistant, as a worker, or as a supervisor. Um, I also work, as it said there, for seven years as a professor. I think that's a term that you guys use, but in England, you just call a lecturer or somebody in charge of lecturers in advanced education and childcare um, training for anybody who was wanting to do that sort of training at all. So my experience, for the most part, for a number of years, which I'm not going to say right now, um, has been working with children, families, and parents. Okay. Another disclosure Clive didn't add in there. He's one of our Starfish Award winners. <laughs> so my disclosures, um, I am a speech-language pathologist in in patent specialist. And the way that Clive and I got connected was from a session that I did almost a year and a half ago now called I Love Data. And Clive read that and knew that that was kind of um, something that he thought would be helpful for his caseload. And he came up with this data project, which was much more complicated than anything I had attempted before. And we've been meeting probably every month, twice a month. He keeps on coming back with, I want the data to do this, or it's not doing that with the student. And we've just been honing this tool that we're sharing with you today, just based on um, Clive's expertise and um, my knowledge on forms and not sheets. So we're really excited to be able to share this with you. And Clive's going to um, take the wheel here in a couple minutes. But we would like to also ask um, those of you who are in the room, looks like we have about 28 of you. Um, would you, in the chat box, introduce yourself, tell us who you are and why you're here today. I think a lot of you might know each other. There's some familiar names and faces in the room. So please introduce yourself in the chat and I'll go through some of these other slides before we get started. So um, Patents Project, we're still promoting achievement through technology and instruction for all students, making sure that Indiana public schools can create and sustain an equitable learning environment for every single student. We do that along with our um, Indiana Resource Network partners, such as the IEP Resource Center, Project Success, and many others. I'm not going to spend too long on this slide, but I did want to note our annual state conference, Access to Ed, is coming up in November. And if you sign up this month, there are, we have some earbuds for you um, if you are interested in that. And it's a really great two days all virtual again this year. So you can pick and choose what sessions are meant for you. And all of it is kind of what you're seeing here today, rubber meets the road kind of stuff from local and national presenters. So if you like this kind of content, you're gonna love access to Ed. One other thing I wanted to mention, 
how this session got started was through those virtual office hours. They're on demand. Anytime that you want to connect with one of our specialists, you can request that. And that's how Clive and I created this. It was through, um, you know, he had a need for his caseload and we were able to help support him in that. Every presentation we do, we always have this slide, the visual representation of the Every Student Succeed Act. And all I'm going to say about this is we know, especially when it comes to behavior intervention, unless our students have access to all of those things that we do in behavior intervention, they likely aren't getting the full benefit of everything on here, the instruction, the assessment, the curriculum. So what we are able to do here when we have good data, when we have good information to be able to show what's going on with the student, then we're finally able to support all of these pieces of this framework. Frequently asked questions, are you going to get the slides? Yes, you're going to get the slides and a bunch of resources from Clive and myself. And this also is going to be recorded and shared. We also ask, well, if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat box. Bigger questions will be answered at the end. So any small questions or big questions you have, please pop it in the chat box and we'll make sure to cover those. Brief agenda, I'm going to go over some form basics so you have an idea what this tool is that Clive and I have created. And then Clive's going to share a lot of his experience over the last year and a half, some tips and tricks and ideas and frameworks that he used, and as well as showing you how once you get all this information into this spreadsheet, how do you analyze it? How do you share it? How do you think about it? And then, like I said, we're going to take questions at the end, and then there'll be an evaluation. And that's how you get all the goodies. Those of you who've um, done sessions with me before, you know it's always a hostage situation. Fill out your honest evaluation, and we will give you all those resources. Please, if you haven't popped in the chat box um, sharing who you are, it looks like we have people from all over with all sorts of backgrounds. So this is really exciting. I think you guys are going to really enjoy um, this collaboration event. So um, I want to show you this example sheet. You are going to get a copy and in that after you fill out your evaluation, that includes those of you who are watching this as a recording, you still need to fill out the evaluation. You will get a copy of this template and this template will need a Google account. So your school Google account will work just great. And that copy will be yours. Nobody else will be able to see it. So you can put student information in there and you can start editing it as you need to. I'm gonna show you a completed example. So this one has over 250 entries in this. So tons and tons of data. And if you can imagine, and Clive will say, this used to be a bunch of post-it notes and paper and things that you had to hand tabulate. And now you don't have to do that anymore. From the participant's point of view, when I go into the form, it looks fairly simple. It's something that you probably have filled out yourself. Staff name, when did this occur? So this allows them to, let's say they're kind of having to do some um, backlogging from days past. So when did this occur? The context of the event, the antecedent, the behavior, the consequence, that ABC data I think a lot of us are familiar with, and then a space for notes. This is a very basic template and you of course can add to this as you need to. That information gets populated here. And this is where we started to look at, okay, we need some other ways to take this information and represent it. What happens automatically in forms is forms tries to be smart and tries to start representing things in graphs and charts. One of the things that we really liked was this sort of um, tally calculator that, you know, when did this occur? And it will start populating um, dates and times. So you can start seeing patterns within that. However, the problem with this is it takes everything all at once. You're not able to tell the form, okay, no, no, no. I only want the stuff from the last two weeks or only want stuff from this particular semester. This backside of the form isn't smart enough to do that for you. So we had to start looking at that piece. You also can't look at, for example, this consequence and automatically know, okay, but what happened before the consequence? What was the antecedent to that? What was the behavior that um, triggered this kind of consequence? You can't necessarily see that very easily. 
So that's the form that we created. So again, all that information gets populated in the spreadsheet and you copy and paste the information that you want. So maybe you want two weeks worth of data, maybe you want an entire semester work, worth of data, maybe you only want the information that was um, submitted by Mr. East. Whatever it is that you want, you just paste into this tab and suddenly all this magic happens. It will automatically tabulate based on the information you wanted to put that um, microscope on. They'll automatically tabulate each of the behaviors, antecedent behavior consequence and context for you. It will create pie charts on that information you wanted to look at. And then it will also create pivot tables. So we have created two basic pivot tables for everyone, but of course you can add more as you go on. So this pivot table is all based on, exit out of there so you can see that a little better, days of the week. So for example, this student, maybe they have early release or Wednesday has a lot of specials. So there's not a lot of academic content. We're seeing slightly fewer reports. And I can pull up in this pivot table, what was the context, antecedent behaviors, and I can start seeing that chain of events happen, make those connections really easily. We have a second one, but again, context and ABC data. And I can pull up and see, okay, we have a lot of reports of him doing positive work. That's the behavior that I want to look at. And I can start seeing how that breaks down really easily with counts. And this might be a lot easier for teams to look at. The other wonderful thing about pivot tables is it's really easy to frame different questions. Maybe your question isn't about behavior. Maybe you want to focus on the context. That just means I pull up this context piece up to the top. Now context is the most important thing up at the top and I can start looking at behavior patterns that way as well. For those of you who just looked at everything that I did and said, wow, that's really overwhelming, don't worry about it. I have a video tutorial and a written tutorial for you on all of these steps. So we didn't wanna to spend too much on this piece. We wanted to give you kind of a taste so we could delve in some other things with Clive. So don't feel like if you didn't get everything I just said right now, you're gonna get a video tutorial and a written tutorial and this template all at the same time. So now Clive is gonna kind of share about his experience over the last year and a half. Well, thanks for the introduction. Um, to me, right, this has been a really, really important um, development in terms of the work that I do and the amount of time I spent. Initially, I think, as Jessica said, I was actually doing like paper information and all, we have a, a unique, unique situation where I work. I've been working here for a while and I get good support from my superintendent and the school corporation and the co-op. And so we developed a paper scenario with these information data. And I used to spend my weekends trying through that data with maybe 15 to 20 kids and trying to look at uh, what the issues are, how we can change and develop. Having this new data collection um, charts and so on, it's much easier for me because everything gets sent to a main area where I can look at each student and see what's happening and I can play around with those charts and information to make sure that it's individually tailored to each young person. And that's the other thing. Um, with data, you can't just have one, fit, one size fit all. It has to be individually tailored. You can do that in terms of the questions that you ask. You can change those anytime you want to and make that different difference and updates and changes as you go along. A lot of the stuff that we do when it comes to an evaluation is actually get information prior. So again, this data is really, really good at getting information prior. Our actual school corporation is, is very different to many others. We have assistants and teachers that take data in the classroom. And that's not probably your situation um, where you're at. But that, that situation developed because when I first came to uh, the co-op and also came to work for this particular school corporation as part of four different corporations, they had a system where they had assistants in most classes to help with children with special needs. And so there were prime persons that could actually take data without missing out on um, supporting the children that was in the class they were in. And so that's continued in a sense. And this, they say, is much, much, much easier to go on a, a, a tablet or an iPad and actually just 
just check four or five boxes and just send it. They can do as many of those as they want to. And so it's really, really easy and simple compared to what they did before. Because they also did the um, pen and pencil thing on a sheet. And they're so much more happy now. And I get so much more responses from them in terms of what's going on with the young person. So we have a system now where we do it actually prior to an evaluation. So if somebody's saying, for example, so-and-so's got issues, can we take some data on that person to see if they need evaluation or if they need any sort of support and help? And sometimes that information is done so that we don't have to take them through the evaluation process because we find that we can at times look at the data and make adjustments and so an evaluation is not needed. Other times we really do need to evaluate someone because the behavior continues and sometimes it escalates and get more difficult. And we're looking at using it for the main students that we use it for. If their evaluation talks about emotional disability or other health impairments or um, autism spectrum disorder, those are the students that we have this set up for over the long haul, if you like, not only prior to the evaluation, but also afterwards as well. One of the things that we realized, that I realized, was that we need to have regular meetings with the people who are taking the data and get feedback and make adjustments to the data that we're collecting as well, because we may have like 20 different things down there that we're looking at in each of those columns in terms of the ABC. Then we find there's a few things that we're not getting any data on at all. But then they'll say to us, well, this is coming up, this is coming up. So we just clearly take off those that was getting zero in terms of feedback at all happening and then put those other things in and then start collecting data on those. So it was like, a, um, shall we say, the data was like always updated, always changing depending on the young person, what we were seeing. And also one of the things that we have is IEP meetings and we may have those regularly again, monthly or whatever we need to with parents, depending on the level of behavior that we've seen and how often that's occurring. And other times, it could be on a six monthly basis, things are going well, so we don't need to have a meeting that much because things are going well. And then eventually, um, if we need to, we can just stop taking data because there's no issues that we need to be looking at. That doesn't happen often, but it has happened. Um, for me, after about 12 months, it seems like it's a lot better scenario. We, we've actually figured out what's the best help and support for that young person. Yeah, in terms of making individual right, when, what we did, we went through the forms, first of all, which you'd see. And those forms, again, are changeable. They're not, they're not, um, they're not so much made for particular persons or they, they are, there's a basic template and you just change it to suit that particular person. Um, and what you do, once, once you go into the, to the classroom, and I'm not sure if everybody does this, but we've got a, what, a behavior app that we use at the co-op, which if somebody's got an issue with a young person, they actually fill this behavior app out. And that behavior app gives me information for a start in point in terms of what they're looking at. So for example, if somebody's looking at aggression maybe in the classroom, or maybe the behaviors is about communication or lack of, so those things give us a starting point. Then I'll go in and see that teacher and say, okay, so what sort of things is happening in the classroom besides that? One-on-one, -on -one, what about breaks? What about lunches? Have we seen things going on there? And that'll help me build that um, ABC page information that we want to collect. And once that's done, and I send that out to the individual teacher and assistants that's in that classroom, they then begin to send me data on a regular basis. And we're linked up through computer or tablets and we're all looking at the same thing. Um, and then every three, two or three weeks, three or four weeks, maybe just depend on the individual student again, we look at the form, we come together, we talk about what can we do here, what we need to change, what we need to update, what we need to take off because it's not happening anymore or it's not an issue anymore. And so it's automatically updated in terms of the team from a team perspective, not just by me alone on the other end. Um, it's very much a partnership I have found to be very, very useful. And the teachers and the assistants are, are really glad that they're included in that process because sometimes they felt left out and just get paperwork to do and don't really know what's going on and what to do and so on. So it's a very, very useful tool to work in partnership with teachers and assistants. And they're happy about that as well because if they have any questions, if they think that they want to change or, or do differently, they may ask me a question or just a conversation and that's done. From my perspective, when it comes to doing this, it's been a really, 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 really good, good information. I think what it is for me is that um, the information itself has helped me to, to realize 
how important data is in terms of rather than somebody's feelings, what they think, or what they think is going on. And the team perspective is really important because they get to home in better on what's going on for that particular children because they're not dealing with four or five different kids. They're dealing with maybe one or two. So they really get to know that child and what's going on as well. And sometimes they will give information on, what's, on what they think could be useful because they're there with the child on a daily basis, only coming every now and getting to observations myself. So it's really important. And they feel more part of the team. They're always asking for ideas when it's by email or by phone calls. The team idea is really, really important because we're all working together to try and get the best for this young person. So making adjustments, trying different interventions and so on, right, is all part of what we do as a team. And as also a teacher as well has got a part and a role to play in that as well. And the schedule adjustments may include like breaks, maybe going to a quiet place, maybe even going for walks, just depends on what we feel is going to be best for that young person and, and to make sure that they have a, as good a day as possible even though they may have issues from time to time. So we wanted to ask the group, if you pop in the chat box, what kinds of behaviors and interventions are you tracking in your area? And just to get, get an idea of who we have in the room here, then Clive will take it away with some frameworks that he frequently uses. So from my point of view, right, my experience over the years, whether in England or here, and it's all relevant, is about what sort of frameworks works for me. And it's individual for everybody, I suppose. But because of the different job roles that I've had, I've, I've used these systems basically, right, when it comes to every individual child to see whether it helps support some of the things we want to do. One of the things that we, we do, and a, and a lot of you are probably aware of this, is what's called the multi-tiered systems of supports, which is MTSS, I think the term is now. That some people use. And that's very much talks about different tiers depending on interventions that you need with the young person, depending on their level of, of behavior, depending on the level of support that's needed, depending on where they are in terms of that tier as well from the school's perspective. So this is information that some of you guys are aware of and I know. Um, and so it's really, really important that you're able to look at this and use it as a basic tool, if you like. One of the things that I do from my behavioral background is use Skinner's issue around reinforcers and consequences, token economies, and reinforce the good behaviors. Um, because I see that that's really important. And sometimes reinforce that good behavior is not necessarily token economy wise. For example, I, I, I use a lot of personal, and you'll see a list of some of the personal things I think later on um, when you're working with kids, that you, in my experience, that I've used in the past, which is really, really good. Um, and I think, I think somebody saw, I think, transition and verbal aggression. Yes, we have students that, that we've worked with in that, with, that way as well. And I think you will find some useful information and ideas as we go through what you can use in that perspective. Also, I'm really, really a, a, a good a proponent of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I mean, because depending on the student that you have, it may be that some of these areas is where they are lacking in terms of their own personal development, depending on how old they are. So for example, some of you guys will, will be aware of this, like the physiological means, in terms of food, water, basic things that they need, sleep and so on. I mean, sleep is a big one sometimes, because if you're an anxious or you may not get enough sleep, you may come to school very tired, that has its own issue in terms of how you get through your day. I've had kids fall asleep, and we've said to them, right, give them a break, let's let them go and lie down for half an hour, whatever they, they need, right, in order to function within school because they haven't got enough sleep. And that helps because some of us, if we're really, really busy, and really, really tired, we're not as nice as it would be if we had got enough sleep. So for young persons, the same thing. In terms of safety needs, in terms of for the parents and for the child themselves, in terms of feeling safe, feeling okay, having family around you, in terms of health issues maybe as well, and where you're living, those things are important. A sense of belonging as well, depending on who you are, and parents that you have, or parents, and also maybe grandparents and so on as well, those things are important. One of the two biggest things that I find is these two, the self, self esteem and self-actualization. Self-esteem of a lot of young people, right, is not as good as it could be. And a lot of the times when we're talking and talking about what issues they have, it's because they have lacked that self-esteem, not only to do the work sometimes, 
but to also interact with others who they feel that may not want to know them because of the way they look, the way they, the way they feel, the way they express themselves. And so these two, self-actualization and also um, self-esteem is something that is lacking a lot of times. I also use Piaget's developmental stages. What I find, right, the 7 to 11 one, the concrete operational stage, sometimes a young person is less, less mature and is not in that stage. And sometimes the behavior um, because of that makes it more difficult to, to assess and see because every child is different. And developmentally, um, in terms of their stage of development, um, it's important to recognize where they're at. One of the things I was saying to Jessica was that with the age of um, iPads and technology, I'm not sure if some of these concepts are gonna to continue to be the same or need to be changed or someone needs to come with a new one um, because of technology and how much more that has an impact on a young person's life in, when they start school and when they're going through school. So again, the other, the other ones that I use is um, the five W's I call it. Always ask the question of, of an incident. Who was included in that incident? What happened? When did it happen in terms of the time of day and where was it? Was it in the classroom? Was it outside? Was it at lunch? And then the big question from those questions is, is the why. And I find the why by teasing out from a young person exactly what's going on. Every young person's brain works differently. And in order to get the information from them right, you need to understand how their brain works. I have maybe 40, 50 kids on my caseload, and every one of those kids are different. Their brain works differently. They process things differently. And so it's really important to recognize that in order to understand them and why they do the things that they do. That's been the biggest thing that I think that I've, I've used with young person. And then it comes to the data now. What is the cause of the data in terms of the ABC? What's antecedents? What's the behavior? And the root cause has five components to it. It may be that young person's ability to communicate and to use language is limited um, compared to others. And depends on their emotion or other aspects might be going through in their life. Young person's attention and working memory is the other one. And these are the root causes, maybe what's going on once you get to know the young person, understand what's going on. For example, that's about remembering the sequence of events. I'm an older person. And sometimes when I lose something, I'm not sure about something, I have to think back to know where did I leave that? Where did I leave that? And I have to think back in terms of sequentially what happened. For some young people, they can't remember. Sequencing is not something they're good at. And that causes issues for them. Then there's the big one that I work with a lot is emotion and regulation that impulse control, that impulse to do something and you can't necessarily control yourself at that time. And so you go and do it and then realize what you've done and then it's too late. And again, it's about how that young person's brain work and how mature that brain is and how well or not well it's developed. Cognitive, that's about adapting to change and different needs. For example, like some young people, right? If you change the schedule, change the time, it just blows their world um, on that day. And they're gonna mess up because they're not used to it. So again, right, adapting to change as needed is really, really, really important. And then there's social thinking. How does the presence of other people impact them and how do they impact others? Understanding that and how that works is also another part of the root cause of what happens. So those five root causes is usually why, maybe two in some cases, why somebody's behaving the way that they are, because the root cause is one of these five. And it's about trying to figure out which one or two it may be influencing and cause that young person to behave the way that they do. So to kind of recap everything Clive had said, all of those frameworks that he uses are informed a lot by, or how to apply those frameworks, I should say, are informed a lot by the data that his team is collecting. And by switching to this Google form, you know, he's getting more data, the team has more communication with him, he has more time to actually do the thing that um, we're trying to do, which is help kids not do paperwork. 
So we're going to look a little closer at um, that incidence calculator, pie charts, and pivot tables. And Clive's going to kind of talk us through this one particular case, how he looks at it. So, um, and again, if you have any questions about, okay, how about the fiddly part? Like, how do you actually make the pivot table? Or how do you get a different pie chart to show something else? That is what that individual one-on-one -on -one part is for. So we want to spend that time um, here kind of talking about from an expert point of view, what this looks like. So do you want me to start at the incidence calculator, Clive? Yeah. So the incident calculator is what they report to you. So once they send that information in, it comes step before the form responses that's where they respond with the form um, in terms of what they see now we put the time in there to make sure that we know what time of day that's happening and also the time that they actually um, i mean the staff can do this sometimes before or after depending on how quickly they can do it but the response is important that they do it as soon before they forget about it if possible and then the context is actually about what is going on are they in it what classroom are they are in the resource room are they doing math? Depends on what exactly they're doing at that particular time. So that's the context of the behavior. And then the antecedents is what, exact, what exactly happened just before? Were they taking a test? Were they doing some academic work? Were they requesting for some direction and help and didn't get it? So they responded in a negative way. Also, some people there, for example, we have, um, they use timers in terms of, um, to see how often they, how much work they need to do in a certain period of time. So it just depends on what the antecedents is actually, what happens just before the behavior. Um, and that's really important because that may be the trigger. It may not be, but it may well be the trigger for the behavior that we see. And one of the things that I like about what I've done with this, because before we never used to put much positive behavior in there, I thought that we need a more balanced look at data as opposed to just being all the negatives. So we decided to put positive stuff in there, like, for example, are they working fine? So when they're working fine, let's tell us about that. So, all, so we don't see all the negative data around what the problems are. They do actually spend a lot of time doing the work. And I suppose you can think that's what's happening when, it's, when they're not reporting data, but it gives more of a balance to um, the whole data collection as well. And then the behaviors, as you can see along there, right, talks about the amount of uh, times you've had. And also, if you notice on this one, academic work was a big deal for the young person, um, as well as requesting for directions and so on. Um, was a big issue more so. So already you can see where the behaviors or triggers of some of the behaviors are happening and also sort of interaction with others. Yes, the other ones will happen. You'll get two, three, and fours depending on the situation, but the big ones are the ones you look at to see, okay, those are the triggers. So we look at how we're doing that in a different way. You can look across, you see the behaviors that's in the next column will be reflected in some of those areas. For example, aggression was there, positive behavior was there as well. And then they use their words to express. That's really, really positive. Um, that's something when they use the words to express how they're feeling or, and so on. And then if you go further down, you'll see um, some of the other areas of behavior. Like, for example, there they could cry or get upset, disrespect of the teacher or staff. And what's important is that right now, which one of those came from either work, doing work, or somewhere else. So that's where some of this information is really, really important in terms of the context of behavior. But the pie charts also, with the next one, gives you an idea of what, what the behaviors are like. So for example, here with this young person, custom redirection and academic work were way where the major positive and not so good behaviors occurred. The next section on the, on the pie chart looks at, okay, I can break these behaviors down. What percent of the behaviors were were an issue. Positive behaviors were like 40%. But the behaviors that we want to curb more of, for example, is Felix physical aggression, because at the moment that's quite high. And then crying and get upset as well is quite high as well, as well as being disrespectful and some immature behavior. So when you align those four or five things together, it's going to equal to or um, the aggregate to the positive behaviors as well. So if you can focus on those behaviors, then you can actually get a positive more going upwards in terms of numbers and those coming down in terms of occurrences that they occur. And then consequences. What were the consequences most of the time? It was more about praise. And praise was helping a lot of ways, particularly with the positive uh, positives, was helping that young person feel a lot better and feel that they were contributing and also be able to 
was less, became less over time. So again, okay. Clive, could you mention a little bit about um, how you use these pie charts with families, like the benefit of this? I think uh, uh, in terms of the meetings that we have as well, in terms of families, we also give them feedback. Um, one of the things that I had situation I had, I'm, I'm not at it, I've had, not had it before as often, but I have been of late, it has been more often, is when parents come to us and ask for support and help, they find that other agencies and things that people have been to in the past that there's nothing, it, it's fine. And we see the behaviors and we know that it's not fine. And when we actually um, talk to parents about what we've seen and talk about the behaviors and they say, yes, we see that at home as well. And so and there's a helpful process for them as well because they're realizing some of the things that they could do at home with the young person as we talk through these monthly meetings or meetings that we have every couple of weeks with parents involved as to what they can do in the home setting as well to help the situation and what they may, may be doing to escalate behavior sometimes at home as parents. So it's, a, it's not just about us at school as well. Parents get involved sometimes in the meetings and when they're able to, and they see, use things and see some of the methods at home to help that young person better behave in their particular setting. And this mainly happens with students who've got IEPs because I'm very much a believer in including parents in what's going on and making them aware of what's going on and get their input as much as possible because yes it is about school but whatever we can use at school to help them at home i'm all for to be honest because that child is going to be much more able to come to school when they get the same type of interventions at home as they get in school wanted to mention for those of you who are looking at these pie charts you can always take these and put them into google docs and it will if you wanted to automatically update. So if you're having to do, you know, reports every month or something like that, you can grab these charts, put them into a doc and it will update based on um, what is in this tablet. So that might make um, your report writing that much easier. All right, to pivot tables. Yeah, it also helps me as well developing my report as well at the, at the end of a period of time. For those monthly meetings, it's really, really important because these numbers give us an idea of if things are going, getting better or they're not. Obviously, if there's increasing numbers, it's obviously that we, are, we need to do some more different types of interventions. If numbers are decreasing, it means that they're working. And it's just a matter of time before that students get used to that activity. I have to say though, with the COVID right now, it's, it's up and down depending on where the student is at. So um, it's not really the, the greatest situation right now. But even so, for the, from the student's perspective, depending on your school cooperation and what's going on, if there is continual support and help, and they know that's there, and we're being consistent, I think that's the biggest thing that helps the students in terms of what we're doing and how we're helping them. All right. So we mentioned at the beginning talking about pivot tables, and I feel like this is probably one of the most um, least understood parts of Google Sheets. But once you get a handle on it, it is really simple and it allows you to ask better questions of your data and see those connections. So Clive had previously talked about, you know, adding all that um, praise, for example, and this allows you to kind of look and see, okay, where's the pattern? It's nice that you know that, you know, 40% of the time he's receiving praise or there's positive behavior, but where is that occurring? Is it only occurring in English language arts and resource room, or is it only occurring at a certain um, part of the day? So these pivot tables allow you to ask better questions. So for example, this one's set up so that you can look by day, but if I wanted to, for example, change this and say, actually, I would love to look at this hour by hour and it sorts it by military hour, I can start saying, oh, what's going on around nine or 10 o'clock, there's a lot of data coming in and I can start seeing, you know, what sorts of things are happening, what sorts of behaviors are we seeing, what sorts of context are we seeing and it tabulates it for you automatically. So you can start playing around with it. I love, um, I would encourage you to play around with pivot tables. You really can't break your data. It's just a different type of lens to look at your data. So like I said, in that template, you have two basic ones where it um, sorts it by days of the week. And then another one that looks at context and ABC data. And again, you just click on that table and it's going to give you these little blocks. And you just ask yourself, like, what kind of question are you asking of your data? And you just organize it in that way. If you want to ask, 
you know, what context is occurring um, based on behavior. If I wanted to ask that question a little differently and look at antecedents, it'll automatically update and I can start seeing connections by opening and closing these little windows. So actually I wanna collapse all of these. So for example, if I was more interested in behavior and I wanted to see, okay, positive behavior, we're seeing a lot of positive behavior, a lot of positive behavior being reported in the resource room and in specials. And that might be really important information to know. So again, just another way for you to notice patterns. And if you notice patterns, behavior is predictable, that means it's preventable. You might have um, better um, outcomes in your intervention. The last tab I wanted to point out is the instructions. Like I said, you're not gonna be left without video and written tutorials. This um, is the version that you have right here is probably gonna stay the way that it is unless um, Clive or one of you come up with something amazing that needs to um, happen. The nice thing is you're always going to have the updated version. So every time you click on make a copy, you're gonna have the most updated version. If we find any bugs or anything that needs to be ironed out, it'll always be there at your fingertips. Again, this is at no cost. We want you to share this. And we um, always look forward to hearing from you things that might help support you and your teams. So I'm gonna finish off. Um, Clive has some really great success stories. So this is a student K, he was a fourth grade student. And um, I think the initial, and this is another thing that I've learned to work in that what you first see is not necessarily what is the reality for that young person. The suspected eligibility was emotional disability. And the data over time revealed that this person didn't need structure. I saw a lack of friends and in terms of relationships as well, didn't have many at all. So it's basically a loner most of the time. Also, one of the other aspects of this young person was that when you're in the room and depending on how small or large the classroom is, noise was an issue for that person. Um, and so sometimes these are shut down, sometimes you used to get angry depending on the situation. And so, so we changed that emphasis from emotionalism to look at autism spectrum disorder because the way this person was reacting to um, the changes in his environment. Also, one of the other things that happens also is that um, in terms of transitioning from different groups as well, there was issues with doing that um, in terms of noise in the hallways, in terms of what affects that young person as well. So we got more and more data looking at this and we realized that maybe the eligibility is not emotional disability. The impacting stuff more than ever is going to be is going to be more of an autism spectrum disorder level from what we see. So I believe that right, is, things don't always turn out what you initially first see. From my experiences now with data, but also, you behaviour said they knows that behaviours are comorbid. So somebody could have issues who are which is most disability, but it also has some attachments or links to. Um, autism spectrum disorder. Also, some young people may have emotional stuff, which is linked to AH, um, ADD or ADHD, it just depends on the young person. So again, it's the individuality part is really, really important. And it's about what best fits a young person's situation. And at the time, also I will say to you that, right, sometimes in my experience with young persons that are certain label when they're younger, and as they've got older, that label's changed because the behaviors that we've seen is, is not what it was um, initially in the first two or three years. And it's also making sure that we are relevant. And then we're looking at the child at that time and I was thinking, okay, that's the label they have now, that's it. They can have that label for the whole time because young person changed. Also, we've had a situation where the label's been removed from the young person because they've managed to be able to so that all these things happen um, to a young person depending on who they are depending on, on their level of accepting and working with and using the, the, um, the guides that they've been given, using some of the techniques they've been given in terms of helping themselves, that eventually, and as they get older, more mature, labels have also been removed. So it's all about depending on the young person, depending on how much time they are able to give to the support and help, and also how much time parents want to be involved in, in the process as well and the whole team of people that's involved with the young person.
I had one particular um, the family in this case. Um, she actually cried when a um, place of work or a uh, school decided to assess the person because she felt that he's had problems all his life. And he said he had a problem all his life, but because of the fact that nobody listened until he was in um, third stroke, fourth grade, was really important. And she cried again when we had the evaluation meeting to explain what was going on and what happened. And that to me is, is, is what the job is about, is helping parents and the young person um, situation much better than it is if you recognize there's something going on, which they knew all the time, but didn't really know what it was and how, and how they could help deal with it. And for that parent, life is a lot better now. For the young person, he's in fourth grade right now and touch wood, um, he's doing fine. Another student that I have that was in second grade, again, initially, the actual thought was because the behaviors was about emotional disability. And same thing, the behavior information, the actual data showed something different was going on. A lot of repetitive, repetitive and obsessive behaviors, which shut down. We had monthly meetings to make adjustments. We had its sensory backs. The young person likes snacks during, during the day because that's what I think life is like at home. So he was allowed to have that. Um, we, we talked and included the family all the time. He had little eye contact. And again, because those call morbid behaviors, we changed the um, eligibility to, again, autism spectrum disorder. So again, it's all about the system, it's about how much the information shows and develops for the young person as they get older, as they grow. One of the biggest things that I say uh, to people about data is that, right, with data, decisions that are made, right, is not about what you as a person and teacher think. It's not about what you feel. It's not about what you remembered or what you believe is going on. It's actually telling you what is actually going on because you're taking data live as it's happening. So I'm a great believer in data and about decisions made about that data. Um, is going to help that young person because it's real information, not just information that we think we feel or we think we saw. And it's all contextualized as well. That's what's really good about it. And the last couple of things is some of the things that um, I use to help me. We've also talked about the tiered intervention process. One of the things that I use, which is this one with the um, three levels, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Those are useful and there's a lot of different aspects on there. But over the years, right, I've kind of like collected my own um, in terms of stuff that I've used. And this is my own like strategies and interventions that I've used over time. The first big one at the top um, is point out what the student's doing right. Don't always focus on the negative. Ask the young person what they can do instead of. Because they're party to this. So like it's like a shared help. It's not just about what I want for the other person, they need to want it as well. Sometimes as adults, we need to realize we need to get down on their level. And that just means don't stand up and cower over them. Sit down next to them, do what you need to do, right? To get to know them a little bit. Make sure there's space between you sometimes because some kids are not used to, they don't know you. So give yourself space. When it comes to giving kids, young people choices in certain situations. Make sure you give them two or three max, because a lot of young people don't have much choice about what happens in their life. And sometimes giving them choices helps them to make decisions and get used to making decisions it's going to be positive for them. One of the things that adults, and it's like, for this I've been, it's like an American culture thing where you want an answer real quick, right now, real quick, real quick. Sorry, some kids, right? Needs time to process what you're asking and to think about it even before they give you an answer. And that's uh, something that I always find. I smile at a lot of times when I go anywhere out to get something shop from the shop or anything. I'll get that for you real quick and it's never real quick. Um, the other thing is redirection. Redirection is, good, is a good way of moving a young person from the negative behavior that's going on right now. Whether it's changing the subject, whether it's going on the activity, whether it's pointing something that's going on over there, right, to get their mind away from what's happening at the time. Redirection is really, really good and it can be instant if it's used well.
So there's a lot of good, good ideas that I've used over time that you can look at, you can see, you can use them. Whatever you need to use to help the young person that you're working with. So at this point, we wanted to make sure that there was room for questions. I see Sarah said, I love all of this so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Clive, so much for taking time out of your very busy schedule and sharing all of this with you and all of this with all of us and um, sharing those documents, which you guys will be able to access for free. So you get the Google tool and um, those two documents from Clive. Thank you so much. Um, just want to add something, which is a major one that I would say to anybody that's working with kids and the assistants when we do the training or tell them about involve a young person. The first two weeks of meeting somebody, try to spend five minutes with that young person, five minutes just asking about them, not about the problems and the issues, asking them about themselves, because you'll, you'll be amazed how much more that young person's get attached to you and, and understands that you understand them by giving them that, those, those five minutes. Really, really big deal. I said it to a lot of assistants. Five minutes. I'm seeing nothing but praise and thank you and can't wait to dig into the tool. I popped um, in there the chat evaluation. If you have any other questions, that's what um, Clive and I are gonna stick around for the next eight minutes. It's now time for everyone to fill out the evaluation. So take out your smart device and scan that QR code or go to tinyurl.com backslash P-A-T-I-N-S-P-G-P. The title for this is Google Tools for Behavior, Data, and Intervention. And your facilitator is only going to be marked as Jessica Conrad. The duration for this is one hour. Any participant who wants all of the materials and slides will need to fill out this evaluation first and then email me, Jessica Conrad, after you fill out the evaluation. My email is jconrad at patinsproject.org.